hopefully this uh, will work now. So we were discussing about the different views on the consequences of uh, the singularity and we were saying that uh, some people adopt a more optimistic view about the future of humanity, others take a more pessimistic view uh, uh, claiming that you know we, we will not be able to control what uh, will happen once machine becomes more intelligent than us and the risks uh, extend to, to uh, to, to even becoming obsolete since we're for the first time in history not going to be the most intelligent uh, species in the planet uh, or even the, the, the extreme dystopian view of this is that this will ultimately lead to, to the extinction of humanity. So hopefully this will not happen but let's see why people uh, believe that. The, the, the reason is that uh, human intelligence uh, uh, progresses in a Darwinian type of way. So we're becoming a little bit more intelligent generation after generation due to natural selection, but this happens very slowly over time. Machines, on the other hand, are, are much newer than us, but they are, uh, uh, their intelligence is progressing uh, by definition more exponential sort of way. And exponential curves have the, the, the tendency one, once they, um, they reach the knee of the curve, as we say, uh, they they become the progress becomes very fast. So at some point, uh, and we are reaching this point, the intelligence of humans and the intelligence of, of machines will be comparable. But from that point onward, uh, there are gonna be leaps of order of magnitude in the uh, intelligence of machines, and very quickly uh, we're not gonna be able to to follow the differences on on how how more intelligent uh, these this, uh, machines are from us. Of course, uh, I have to say that this, this has been fears that we have seen before. This is a, a front cover from the Spiegel. Uh, these three covers have, you know, uh, two decades uh, uh, difference uh, from each other and all three are predicting the same thing that, you know, uh, first uh, machine automation and robotics in factories is coming to take human jobs, then information technology in the offices was coming to take uh, human jobs, neither of these two uh, has happened, now uh, AI is, is going to do the same, we, we're seeing this time and again, up to now at least uh, technology has always proven to be disruptive in the sense that many jobs uh, are being lost but many more uh, are being uh, created and uh, humanity as a total has definitely benefited from this. Uh, of course, it's the first time that we're seeing things like uh, what we're seeing now with AI, so we'll see, we'll see how things go. So, uh, let's move into the two specific technologies that we're going to discuss. One of them is uh, IoT and uh, uh, the types of networks that uh, combine uh, blockchain with IoT that uh, nowadays are being called in a term that I'm not very fond of uh, decentralized physical infrastructure networks or DEPINs. So for those of you that are not familiar with IoT, uh, the, the Internet of Things is, uh, is the network of Internet connected physical devices. So everything that is connected to the Internet in the sense that it has a TCP IP address and can communicate uh, over the same internet infrastructure, but it's not a human, there's no, uh, there's not someone behind the keyboard and the mouse uh, operating it, but it's, uh, it's based on, a, on an architecture that allows some sort of, uh, of machine. It might be, you know, the fridge in your home or your smart TV uh, or your uh, 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 car uh, or even your router. Uh, these are all parts of the Internet of Things. And usually these devices are embedded oops sorry are embedded with uh, with sensors that allow them to communicate with their environment they run some software which allows them to process the information they receive from their environment via their sensors and have some sort of connectivity that allows them to pass this information or the decisions that they make based on this information to other devices over the internet or receive instructions from such uh, other devices. What most people do not realize is that the Internet of Things is not a curiosity, it's not like a small part of the internet. It is today larger than the Internet of Humans. So the number of machines that are connected 
uh, to the Internet of Things is more than the number of, of, uh, of humans. And it's predicted to reach uh, around 30 billion such devices by 2030. Uh, this makes the Internet of Things the first many-to-one information technology in history, in the sense that up to now, in the computer era, there was one computer for many people. The smartphones were the first era where we started having personal devices, so we, we reached a, a one-to-one -one relationship, more or less. But sensors, if, if uh, we start measuring in the, them in the tens or in the hundreds of billions, given that we are like eight billion people on the planet, we, it's the first technology that there are going to be many machines serving each person. And interestingly, they're not going to be... It's, they're going to be machines that they serve us in the background. So they are they're pervasive, they're all around us. We, we tend to forget about them. Uh, we, we don't remember, you know, actively every day how many hundreds of um, chips uh, exist today in a typical car that we, we drive. Uh, and this is something that, uh, you know, on the one hand creates lots of very useful services uh, for us. Uh, on the other hand, it, it creates all sorts of uh, newfound uh, problems that uh, we, we, we didn't use to have when computers were really, you know, large enough and visible in front of us. Uh, huge spectrum of applications for the Internet of Things, both for the consumer and the enterprise segment, things from smart homes to, to wearable devices, to connected health, uh, to transportation, vehicle to vehicle, uh, communications, for example, building automation, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. IoT exists today, but this does not mean that all its problems have, have been solved. There are a number of challenges associated with, uh, with these devices and sensor-based communication uh, between them, the most important of which is the issue of security. Uh, since these devices remain invisible while collecting sensitive data about us. They could be eavesdropping on our discussions, tracking on uh, our location. These are things that are happening today. They tend to recede on the background of our consciousness. Uh, and the problem is not necessarily that these things happen. I mean, if they are, um, uh, you know, well designed and we are cautious of their existence, we can probably manage them. One of the problems is that, by definition, these devices are small and not very computationally powerful. So they typically exchange data in unencrypted form, and they cannot run complicated security algorithms, uh, or some of them, they cannot even be remotely upgraded or patched. So we are, uh, uh, you know, in our computers, we, we, we rely sorry, on the fact that um, the developers of an operating system or an application release uh, continuous updates that allow us to uh, take advantage of the latest security patches uh, every time a vulnerability is identified. This is not typically the case with, with the Internet of Things and we need to be extra careful. So this might create the next major vulnerability of the Internet because hackers are increasingly targeting uh, such devices like our webcams or voice assistants because they are the, the weak links in our computing uh, infrastructure and they can be more easily attacked than full-blown computer uh, systems. And, you know, uh, cyber wars are, are mostly, uh, or not mostly, I mean, uh, to, 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 a large, to a large extent um, uh, targeting such types of, of devices. Uh, the other issue is that if we have tens of billions of devices all the time sensing their environment and generating data, we're talking about an unprecedented volume of real-time streaming data that we'll, we will need somehow to, to harness and use. Uh, and this is where decentralized physical infrastructure networks uh, come into play. Uh, these are networks that try to fuse Technologies like the ones that we have been discussing in this course, blockchain, crypto, and smart contracts, with uh, IoT. In other words, the pins are Web3 protocols that integrate and offer services and resources from a decentralized network that consists 
or, or physical machines, and they are typically incentivized, uh, the, the, the participants of this network, via some sort of crypto token uh, model. So you can think of them as a mix of IoT uh, and blockchain. They are IoT networks in the sense that they connect IoT devices, but unlike IoTs, they focus on decentralization to overcome some of the problems that we discussed in the previous slide, like security and privacy uh, vulnerabilities. And uh, unlike blockchains, they emphasize the integration of physical machines and resources to create a network that provides some useful service uh, to the world. Uh, this is a very expanding ecosystem, so these are just a couple of uh, uh, images that show examples of the PIN networks that exist across different segments like energy, infrastructure, smart homes, mobility networks, healthcare, logistics, uh, and there's a combination between physical infrastructure, so all these things, and digital resources that are needed uh, in terms of storage, uh, databases, compute networks, which are becoming a big thing and are very related to the issue of AI that we're going to be discussing and so on. So one of the biggest narratives at the moment is such decentralized physical information networks that are going to bring the Internet of Things to the blockchain domain. Let's move on to AI and address the question of whether computers can really be intelligent. Uh, AI is about machines performing tasks that are normally associated with human intelligence, like visual perception, natural language processing, complex decision making, uh, and so on. In reality, the goalposts are moving here, and I very much like this theorem that says AI is whatever hasn't been done by computers yet. So. Uh, if, if you asked someone a few years ago whether you know, a computer playing chess would be uh, considered intelligent, they would definitely say yes. Today is just a commoditized application to the extent that we have uh, uh, you know, computers playing chess much, much better than the best human players. And there's all sorts of um, applications in which uh, machines are becoming much more intelligent than the best human, not, not the average human, than the best uh, world champion. Uh, today, AI is more about things like, uh, you know, uh, autonomous robots or self-driving vehicles and so on. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, in 10 years, these are going to be considered everyday applications of computing and something more exotic is going to be considered AI then. The real difference is that over the past few years, AI has been crossing into our everyday lives. With things like face recognition software, digital assistants that we have not only in our phones, but nowadays inside our mobile phones, uh, language translation, other applications, new computer interfaces, we're talking about now brain-machine interfaces, some of them started becoming non-invasive, so AI is, is, is gradually eating into our everyday lives. But there are different types of, of AI, right? Uh, most AI that we have had up to now would be classified as what we call narrow intelligence or weak AI. So machines can perform a narrow set of specific tasks very intelligently, like playing chess, as we said, but they cannot do anything else. So they are very intelligent, but on a very narrow uh, type of application. With LLMs, uh, neural networks, and uh, applications like ChatGPT, we, are, we have entered probably the, the era of artificial general intelligence, where AI becomes stronger and machines possess human-like abilities to think and make decisions. We are not there yet. We have not, uh, you know, uh, uh, undoubtedly created general intelligence because even the most sophisticated LLM now is, is good at uh, things like understanding and producing uh, language or images or videos or stuff like that. But uh, this, is, this is much better than a narrow intelligent task, but it's not as, uh, uh, as broad as the human intelligence, but we are getting there. And as we are getting there, we started thinking about we have started thinking about the next step, which is what we call an artificial superintelligence. Just a hypothesis at this stage: 
machines that are so intelligent that become much more intelligent uh, than us as uh, as we said thus unleashing this famous singularity ai is already outperforming humans in in uh, many tasks and is becoming better and better every day and these tasks are now starting to, to combine with each other the real revolution has happened through uh, what we call large language models or llms uh, which are uh, a form of uh, natural language processing uh, they they utilize uh, neural networks to to process uh, words uh, in relation to other words in a sentence and they they are able to predict what would be the next, uh, the most likely next uh, token or word in uh, in a sentence. And although this sounds trivial when you look at it from the uh, individual sentence perspective, these can grow into layers that allow them to understand not only small tokens, not only individual words, not only small sentences, but uh, uh, full uh, uh, pieces of text that allow them to to decipher meaning from from uh, uh, what we tell them and they respond to us in a way that feels like human although by all means there is just software running so there's no uh, consciousness or or or, 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 or other uh, properties associated with uh, with humanity the interesting thing is that this belongs to a class of uh, AI called unsupervised learning, uh, in which uh, the model self-learns, and this allows these models to become more intelligent the more data they're fed in and the more experience they get. So this is a bit like the way humans learn as we grow and as we uh, are uh, uh, exposed to stimuli, we become more intelligent, and this is something that uh, these models um, uh, have started harnessing at a level that is comparable to human intelligence. Uh, so they have created a number of, of new industries. As, as you know, I'm sure that uh, most, if not all, the, um, uh, the audience of this uh, lecture is already exposed and uh, many of you are using the uh, such LLMs in your, in your everyday lives, either personal or, or business. Uh, it is interesting that we have already reached a stage in which um, if you uh, harness the power of prompting such models well the types of responses that they can produce uh, sometimes is, uh, is is not comparable it's it's better than one, what most humans uh, would be able to produce even the best of them in their fields of course there are problems like hallucinations and uh, and you know inventing stuff so they are not very good at, at interestingly they are much better in creative tasks than in factual tasks so if you ask them something that uh, is factual they might invent things that simply are not true and because they respond in a way that sounds very confident and very professional we tend to believe them uh, but when they are rightly prompted in, in creative tasks they can become uh, amazing and think that the types of responses that you get today is the worst responses you will ever get because these things are getting better and better by the, by the day so by next year or the year after uh, we're only going to be seeing improvements in their performance uh, a number of uh, such models a number of such providers uh, out there text generation is the most common feature uh, of all these llms today but as i said you know um, uh, audio video images and stuff like that are starting to be integrated and we're only going to be seeing improvements as we go along however as with the internet of things this type of uh, ai is is very centralized and centralization as we discussed previously in this course uh, has a number of short shortcomings first one is scalability so such systems can may struggle to scale efficiently because they rely on a uh, finite number of, of servers and as demand increases and we have seen this uh, lately they can become overwhelmed so the 
training and deploying a competitive LLM today is already so competitive that only very few very large enterprises or state actors can do it. The other thing is data privacy. Uh, every time we write something on ChatGPT, uh, we 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 release data uh, to to the to the company behind that, that LLM. And as we are becoming more and more um, accustomed to, to speaking to someone that we think as a, as a human being, we might start sharing information that we wouldn't normally want to, to, to share with, with outsiders. Uh, there's innovation bottlenecks always in centralized systems because we are everyone is dependent on the innovation capability of the very few producers and providers of such competitive models. Energy consumption is, is a thing because the, the demands of such systems are, are very, very uh, big. And uh, you, I'm sure that you have heard about biases uh, because of the centralization in how these systems are being trained. This may result in models that do not perform equitably across different demographics or, or segments. And you know, the, the recent troubles of uh, Google's uh, Gemini uh, project is, is a good example here. So there might be an, an opportunity to bring crypto into AI in the sense of bringing decentralization into the architecture of uh, uh, AI systems to mitigate some of these shortcomings. So decentralized AI might reduce the risk of a single point of failure, as we discussed earlier in the course. This is a, uh, one of the biggest benefits of decentralization. It might reduce the risk of cyber attacks because it, um, uh, it, there is no single server that can be or single set of servers that, that, that a malicious party would need to attack. Decentralized systems are more resilient because there's uh, uh, redundancy uh, among different machines. Data sovereignty, uh, sovereignty can be um, uh, respected more because uh, we, it might allow data to, to remain local or to be transmitted and stored in encrypted forms using um, techniques like zero-knowledge uh, proofs. Uh, community governance uh, might be a good way to uh, mitigate the reliance on the decision or on the decisions of a small number of uh, state or uh, uh, enterprise actors that uh, are you know uh, not democratically elected at least the, the enterprise ones and uh, might choose to make decisions that are mostly to their benefit and not to the rest of humanity. Data security because of the distributed nature of decentralized AI and edge computing in the sense that uh, AI today is very centralized and we need to have intelligence more closely to the, um, to the edges of the network where decisions and actions uh, uh, typically take place. So there have been a number of examples uh, of uh, projects that are trying to, to combine uh, crypto and blockchain with uh, AI and create decentralized architectures for machine learning networks. As an example, this is um, uh, BitTensor, uh, a protocol that tries to create such a decentralized machine learning network where uh, contributors to the network may produce a number of forms of decentralized digital commodities as they are called in the BitTensor parlor. One of these communities is machine intelligence. There's a number of other things that are happening like compute power, storage applications like prediction markets and so on. And each category of such digital communities produced in a different subnet. So uh, BitTensor is organized in a number of, is, is a network that has its own blockchain but is organized into a number of different uh, subnets that hang below this, this uh, blockchain and users can tap on, on these uh, subnets to, to run applications that have uh, specific uh, functionalities. 
These subnets exist outside the blockchain, so they, they, they do off-chain computations but are connected to it. Um, there are two types of players in each subnet. There's miners who produce um, in, uh, the digital commodity like intelligence and there's validators who rank the miners according to uh, how well they are. All of them are being uh, awarded in, uh, in the network's native token, which is called TAO. Uh, with the Greek letter uh, TAF, uh, and uh, there's a, an underlying blockchain called uh, SubTensor that manages the consensus on this network. So this is a good example of how blockchains and uh, AI might uh, run together. Of course, we're too early. I mean, uh, I'm not sure that the network is producing anything of actual practical value today, or at least anything that is comparable to, to what can be produced by centralized, by the best centralized providers today. However, as we have seen with the early days of Bitcoin, uh, the, the ability of such decentralized systems to, to scale up if they catch in the market is, uh, is, uh, is unprecedented and we might see um, markets for artificial intelligence uh, created uh, in the next few years. So let's bring everything together. So all this was an introduction to, to say that we are we need to start becoming more aggressive in our predictions. Uh, blockchain is here, AI is here, IoT is here, and all of them are exponential technologies. They are growing in a way in which when they when they become really commercially uh, available and they are all becoming uh, nowadays the types of uh, applications that can be built are, are, are amazing. Each of these technologies I think deserves all the attention they're getting. We have been discussing crypto and blockchain a lot in this course but imagine what can happen when we take them together and when you know we multiply the transformative effect that each one of them uh, can have on its own. So what we imagine uh, is a future that is driven by uh, machine connectivity uh, enabled by uh, the Internet of Things, data exchange and decision making enabled by uh, artificial intelligence and business commercial services that are being uh, afford, uh, afforded by uh, decentralized ledger technologies. So the Internet of Things connect billions of machines and sensors, these are generating unprecedented quantities of real-time data. And if we have intelligent enough algorithms that enable those connected machines to act on this data and trigger services, then blockchain and crypto can function as the transaction layer where machines start uh, signing service contracts between each other exchange data and are getting paid uh, with each other in a secure uh, manner facilitated by smart contracts and uh, crypto tokens. Uh, so I see both smart contracts and digital currencies as being very core elements of the future of this uh, machine economy in the sense that smart contracts will facilitate the automatic execution but also the enforcement of contractual terms between machines because remember if we are talking about machines there are two big differences first of all there is no machine lawyer or arbitrator or whatever that these machines can go to if there is a, uh, uh, an issue so there needs to be a contractual scheme that allows them to, to agree on terms but also these terms to be automatically enforceable by uh, by code uh, and also we need uh, tokens we need financial tools value exchange mechanisms that allow the machines to pay each other even in arbitrarily small communities and digital currencies offer these uh, monetary forms as we said earlier in this course they are more both programmable and active source of money so there might be money more suitable for machines rather than uh, humans. So the role of IoT, AI and blockchain is summarized in, in, in this slide. 
I think the Internet of Things will be the underlying layer where data is being collected and transmitted over an Internet architecture. AI, if it manages to become decentralized, this is the big question mark here because it's still very centralized to be able to support this dream. Sorry, uh, it will be if it becomes decentralized, it will be synergistic with IoT, creating small brains that exist at the edges of the network and then blockchain and crypto will create a layer of decentralized governance financial tools and currencies and integrate everything together in a uh, unified architecture so this is a potential technology stack uh, for the future that we're imagining uh, at the bottom layer a dense network of internet of things connected uh, physical objects each of them having sensory abilities, some of them also having actuating capabilities, so having actuators that allow them to do stuff in the physical environment. AI becoming decentralized, so having algorithms that run not at central servers, but at the edges of the network, so with mini brains. And finally, distributed ledger technology, smart contracts and digital currencies, enabling machine-to-machine -machine commerce. This machine commerce will be built by the combination of crypto, what we have been discussing in this course, that creates new forms of money that are suitable for machines, and blockchain, which creates an internet of value, an internet of trust. We said earlier in this course that blockchain alone will disintermediate industries, removing middlemen, combined with AI and IoT, might remove humans from the equation uh, completely, giving rise to, to uh, a sort of machine-to-machine -machine economy in which we will have uh, autonomous AI-based uh, economic agents. So, this is it. The, the key takeaways from, from this session is that uh, we have three technologies that are foundational. They are becoming commercially available at the same time. They are bound to, to, to start uh, being combined with each other. And they will probably unleash an era of machine-to-machine -machine and human-to-machine uh, applications. And this will create huge changes to our future economies and societies. Looking forward to discussing this with you in the upcoming live session. As always, please... Uh, post your questions on, uh, on Moodle and uh, Discord and we will take them on uh, during our live session. Thank you.